And now, from the great state of Mississauga in Ontario, Canada, it's the Ted Wallachin Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place, for the finest in men's fashion. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing a state administration with ease. ETP Canada. And now, here's Ted. Thanks so much, Becky, and welcome everybody to another episode. My special guest this weekend, indeed, is a legend in the television industry. He has received 25 Emmy nominations, three Emmy Awards, plus the Director's Guild Award, and he has a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame. He has produced television programs for the likes of Dinah Shore, Judy Garland, Jonathan Witters, to name but a few. He was the creator and producer of the American Comedy Awards, which ran on national television for 15 years. He produced the first five years of the Grammy Awards. He's regarded as the father of reality TV, having created the the series Real People with Byron Allen. And he created television's groundbreaking sketch comedy series Laughing, which ran from 1968 to 1973, eventually becoming the number one show on television. He has just written a memoir entitled Still Laughing, A Life in Comedy. It's a real honor to have on the program George Schlatter. Mr. Schlatter, welcome, I, if I may call you Mr. Schlatter. It's a real honor, sir, to uh, to meet you, and I appreciate you taking the time to join us this afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I don't know about the Mr. or the honor, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but I am. Uh, and congratulations, by the way. Uh, they've named the National Comedy Center and named the theater after you in honor of you and your wife, Jolene, in, uh, in Jamestown, New York which is a place that you have a, take a great responsibility for, for forming the Comedy Center. Let's talk about that for a minute. Well, they asked me if I could send them a couple of things, and I said yes. And then Journey, who I love, said, do I have anything else? And I said, lady, I have a whole warehouse full of else. So I started sending them material, and I realized I had hundreds and hundreds of tapes of all of the comics that I'd worked with over the years. So we sent that all to them, and now it's all become a part of the museum, which I think yeah. is a very valid valuable contribution to our society that collection and it's strictly comedians it's not it's not anybody else in the periphery of, of show business no writers no directors no just comedians and everybody i mean we got from from ed Wynn to robin williams and from jackie gleason to stan laurel and uh, just just stand up comedians and it's wonderful you walk through there and you laugh it's the only place i know of where every place you look you still you have a reason to laugh and i love it as as a young kid, I mean, I'm talking about a young, young kid, who do you recall that first made you laugh or, or first impressed you and, and, and injected you with that passion for comedy? My mother. Yeah. My mother was a funny friend. She was a concert violinist, but she had a marvelous sense of humor. We didn't have a lot of money, but we laughed. And my, my favorite thing, for instance, one, one uh, 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 April Fool's Day, she was cooking pancakes for the whole four boys and uh, my her husband, and she cooked pancakes. But in each pancake, she put a little circle of muslin. So we all sat down, scarfing down these pancakes, and wound up with a mouthful of cloth. I thought the woman was going to have <laughs> jokes to that joy. But she was like this. So I think probably the first person that really made me laugh and made me feel good, because it's the best feeling you can have. One of the two best feelings you can have right, is a big laugh. And the other one, if I forget, anyway. But, <laughs> but she made me laugh. And the laughter, you think about it. It's the ultimate, it's the ultimate experience is laughter. It and is, no, it is. No matter how bad anything hurts, if you laugh, it'll hurt, it'll feel better. It's true. I mean, I mean it releases, uh, you know, endorphins or whatever it is. I'm not, I'm, I'm not hardly a, a scientist. But I mean, I mean you it, know it, how to spell endorphins. I, well, exactly, exactly. But, but I mean, it, it does. It, it's like, you know, they talk about pets and, and how pets relax you. You know, you're the petting of a dog or a cat. And, and it certainly does do that. And then laughter is the same thing as well. I mean, you can have be having the worst day in the world and sit down in front of your television and, and turn on one of your favorite movies or a television when show. A ba- when a baby's it. born, you don't have to teach it how to eat, sleep, lie, you know, uh, or laugh. And uh, yeah. just naturally, it's uh, you don't know what they're laughing about. Later on, we find out it's us. But uh, <laughs> laughter is very, very therapeutic. And it's gotten me. Paid my rent. It, well, yeah, I guess so. When, when you're a kid in school, were you a good student? I was a funny student. I was not a good student. I played football, and um, 
I remember one time the Spanish class was right before football practice, and I never got anything right. So they were always at, so she kept asking me, what year did Columbus discover America? And I said, I didn't know, and I gave her all kinds of weird things. So one time I was ready for it. She said, what year? And I said, mil cuatro cientos noventa y dos, which was the wrong, which was the wrong answer, right? Uh, what did, it, what she'd asked me, what did Juan say to Pedro? And I said, you know, 1492, the whole class broke up. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it was just, it was just laughter was the panacea. Laughter was what got me out of the valley. Laughter is what, uh, uh, you know, glossed over and pain, you know, released all of the pain from any other experience. It's a yeah. wonderful thing that we've got, to, we've got to have more laughter. I don't mean just in, in elections. Yeah. We're right on the border of that, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Whoever thought uh, the politicians would be funnier than the comics? Yeah, honest to God, it's 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 so true. When you think about you know over the last you know since the election of Donald Trump, how it's changed the the, the face of uh, late night comedy, all the late night comics. I mean, it's he produced eighty percent of the material for them without without them doing anything. It bothers me a little bit because I see it's all dark. And it's all angry and everybody's yelling. I don't yeah. see any joy. I don't see any happiness. You know, you, you don't need to be dirty. I don't need the language. You don't need it. Just it's a subject matter. They give us such a wonderful opportunities to laugh. So I think we've got to be a little careful of getting laughs by taste rather than uh, humor, you know? Yeah, it so, seems to me that, that like when you when you look back on on Johnny Carson's days of, of with with the Tonight oh. Show, Carson never exposed his political cards. You never knew whether he was a Republican or a Democrat oh. because he took oh. shots at both sides. That's yes, yeah, not yeah. it's and it's so evident today that all the talk show hosts they're they're all piling up against uh, against Trump, rightfully or wrong. I mean, whatever your side is. But it, it's like, it's so one-sided. And after a while, it gets a little tiresome. And politics is not the only thing that is to laugh at, you know. No. Uh, it's a bodily function which we must have. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm a little concerned because everybody seems to be yelling. And everybody seems to be angry. And everybody seems to be doing a drill jokes about Trump. Trump is not a punch. Is, Trump is a punchline. You don't have to be, do everything about Trump. But there's so much else that's going on. There's commercials and there's all the things that are going on, which are funny. And we need to laugh. It's the best bodily function you can have, that big laugh. And uh, I haven't had a big laugh since my honeymoon. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you surround yourself with people that make you laugh. That's why we wrote the book. I set out to do a book that made you feel good. So I collected all the funny things that have happened to me. There's a lot of yeah. things that are not funny that have happened to me and a lot of my colorful past is not too funny, but what's in the book are the things I remember that made me laugh. Let's let's talk about uh, bef before we get to to the main. It's not really the book isn't just about laughing. It's 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 about your life in comedy. It's yeah. called Still Laughing: yeah. A Life in Comedy. Let, let's go back to the, to the beginnings of your life in show business and back in in the fifties. And your first uh, adventure was at Ciro's Nightclub in Hollywood. Paint me a picture of Ciro's Nightclub in in those days. Well, Ciro's was a big nightclub on the Sunset Strip, and it was the leading nightclub. We had, you had the Macambo, you had Ciro's, you had the Crescendo. Then in Los Angeles, you had the Coconut Grove, which was a classy hotel thing but Ciro's was the leading saloon nightclub and uh so at Ciro's I began booking a lot of comedians and it, it enhanced the uh, nightclub experience and uh, so I booked everybody into Ciro's and then as a result of my success booking acts into Ciro's I got an accountant to book the acts into the Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas which was another experience you know because my experience in Las Vegas with the people that I met there who were Quite colorful. None of whom are in the book, by the way. None, most of them are not even alive. Huh? Yeah, you're talking about a, a time in Las Vegas today is, is 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 run by corporations. Back then, it was founded and 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 run by the mob, and that's the time mob when is you... just an ugly word. It was by by the yeah. Okay, I'll settle for mob. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, the organized brotherhood of associates. See, it was each one of the hotels had a different city they were connected with. And it mm -hmm. sounds like when you see Greenfall Jungle, like it was a huge conglomeration. It wasn't. They didn't. All of those things happened, but not to one person. And not right. in one. They happened over a period of time. And um, 
uh, I was always amazed when they started pulling uh, these barrels out of the ocean, out of the lake, you know, because a lot of people I knew were floating around in those barrels. But they didn't they didn't have to do it that many times to make the impression, you know, get the message out there. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, of course. It was, color- it was colorful in Vegas then, boy. Well, I was a kid. I was just, you know, I was very, very young, and I knew all the acts, and uh, um, I could get them to do uh, the saloons, you know, and we had we had a great time in Vegas then. And I, strangely enough, I'll tell you what I did in Vegas. In Vegas, you 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 uh, you couldn't serve booze uh, anywhere. It was performances, so you could do music but not performance. It was an act called the Mary Kay Trio, who I knew, and I put the Mary Kay Trio into the lounge faced away from the gambling so they didn't have to pay the 20 percent tax and so we brought chorus girls from all over las vegas to come into the frontier of the lounge gay 90s lounge and it, it's tra- changed vegas and that brought in the the uh, lounge acts and then then you could stay up till five o'clock in the morning and mm-hmm. uh, uh, uh breaking the rules breaking the rules has been a large part of uh, what paid my rent and part of that was booking acts, booking lounge acts, performing, and uh, everybody worked the lounge. And that when, when the rest of the shows ended, we would take Sinatra and Dean and everybody, and we'd go to the Silver Slipper to the lounge, and we'd see Hank Henry. None of those names, names mean anything today, but boy, they meant a lot back that long ago. And what kind of money were, were, was was happening at that time in, ter- in, in terms of the payment for the the, for the performers? Money, you're into a, you're into a touchy area. Money, money is money. There was two salaries. There was the check that people got for what they did. Then there was side money. You know, there was a, a, a diversion. And uh, part of the side, they got the money, the check. It was X dollars for performing. But then there was the salad on the side, right? And then they got uh, yeah. uh, cash because they didn't pay tax on tax on the tax. Yeah. So uh, uh, it was different then. It went the accounting. You know, they had the um, they had the IRS in the lounges counting money. It was a different environment then. You got by by with a lot of stuff. You know, uh, three, four, five hundred dollars or two thousand dollars was the difference between what they were supposed to get as a salary and what they got. A uh, sandwich on the side, you know, salad we would call it, you know. Yeah, it was a colorful time, but you paid them in a bag, you know. And uh, uh, um, one time, you know, you had to, I had to pay them between shows sometimes because they didn't really trust some of these hotel owners. So uh, we would go there and we'd take the money in a bag, and they would count the money and so forth. But Will Maston always had to count it before he went on. I'd say, Will, it's all there. Will didn't count real fast. You know, Will sent it Sammy <laughs> Davis's uncle. But yeah. it was a question of paying them before they went on. And uh, it was different. You couldn't no more. You could not do Vegas the way we did it then. You could never do it today. It was uh, they had different rules. The IRS has learned a lot. And the hotel owners are much more legitimate now. Of all the people that you, that you met when, in, during your time in in Las Vegas, who became your your close friends? Frank Sinatra was one of them for sure. Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, uh, Joey Bishop was one of the uh, committee at that point, and then uh, uh, then all of the acts that worked big. I mean, it was everything from Sophie Tucker to Peggy Lee and Lena Horne uh, to uh, Will Maston. I mean, there were saloon acts not then. See, but. The thing is now, when they appear on television, you can't do that same thing over and over and over again. So you right. could do it then. You could do the saloon act. They could do the same act for two years, and nobody had seen it before. You know, but it was a colorful time, and uh, uh, and they had Chuck Wagon at twelve o'clock, and so everything was free at twelve o'clock. But what I introduced was a show at two o'clock in the morning, and uh, away from the gamblers, and uh, that's when Hank Henry and all of those people came with the Silver Slipper, and the whole. The, the, the committee, the, the group, we would go from the Sands Hotel, second show, we ended like one o'clock, and we'd all go over to the Silver Slipper Hotel, Frank and Dean and Sammy and, and uh, Joey Bishop and the rest of them. And uh, it, was, it was a different time then, and I, I'm glad I was part of it. And that's you, what I tried I, to capture in the book. I tried, in the book, I tried to capture the feeling of fun that I had back then. It was a long yeah, time ago, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, for uh, sure, for sure. I don't see anybody having... I see people getting angry. I see people loud. I see you know dark colors. I don't see people really just warmly enjoying. And uh, 
having a good time. Uh, it's much different now. I miss the old days. I never thought I'd hear myself saying that, but I do. I miss the old days. And come to think of it, I am the old days. I'm, I should be taking a dirt nap by now. But I just, that's, what I, that's what I enjoyed in the book. I said, I started writing this book, and I said, nobody's going to read this. But they said, good enough if I can read it. So I went through, and all I did, I walked through the office, and I told Marta, it's a wonderful moment that's been with me for a long time, I said, tell all of these stories, and she put them all together, and then I took out everything that Jolene didn't want to read about, which is some of my colorful past, and we put it all this collection of anecdotes. It's all it's just a series of stories, and uh, I, have a, I had a good time doing it, and people said they're having a good time reading, because there's nothing like that out today that makes you just feel good. You pick up and say, oh, I feel good, and that's that's important to me. So tell me about uh, how you managed to convince uh, Ronald Reagan uh, to appear in, in, in Vegas with uh, the Marquee Chimps. Yeah, that was part of my colorful past. I used to work at MCA. <laughs> Lou Wasserman was the head of MCA, and he called one day, and he said, I want you to book Ronald Reagan into the Frontier Hotel. Ronald Reagan had not been president. Then. It wasn't even Governor Reagan. Then. Right, I he's said, just Mr. the actor. He so Mr. Wasserman, he doesn't do anything. Mr. Wasserman said, that's not my problem. It's your problem. Book Ronald Reagan. So I booked Ronald Reagan in the hotel and put him with an act called David, whatever it was. And uh, there was a, an act. I put Ronald Reagan into the head of the act. And it wasn't that good. It was like five guys. So I remember he'd done a movie with a, uh, called Bedtime for Bonzo. And right. it was a chimp. So I said, I'll get the chimps. So there was an act called the Marquean Family, which were five chimps, a wonderful, wonderful act. In their contract, it said they had to do 30 minutes. Well, then Ronald Reagan did an hour, and the show ran too long. So uh, I said to Mr. You know, at the Frontier Hotel, Jay Cosmo, I said, the show's going to run long. And he said, no, it's not. I said, oh, okay, excuse me. So I went to Ronald Reagan. He couldn't cut his act. So I go to these gorillas. I said, we're going to have to take some time out. They said, the act is signed contract for 30 minutes. So I, so I had him do the first 10 minutes in the hallway, and then we'd open the door, and they'd go out on stage. Well, it worked pretty <laughs> good for about four nights. But four nights then, they said, hold the show. So now the chimps did their whole act in the hallway. And then they said, okay, start. We opened the doors. And these five gorillas got loose in the Frontier Hotel. And pandemonium. They were in the lights. They were in the They were sitting there. One of them drank a bottle of tequila. It was absolute pandemonium. Very funny, <laughs> but pandemonium. So uh, Jay Kozlov said to me, tell them just to do that. I said, uh, Mr. Kozlov, you didn't, you didn't ever ask, have Jake ask you twice. He explained it to you once, and you got it. So I said, uh, I, I can't do just that, you know. So he said, then tell the actor to just it. So we had to take the time out of Ronald Reagan's act. So Ronald Reagan never forgave me for booking him in the Frontier Hotel working with five gorillas. I very, became very close to Nancy, but Ronald Reagan was always sensitive about me booking him to work with five gorillas. And yeah, Ronald well, Reagan was a great act for him, which, by the way, had he taken it to Washington, he'd still be president. Yeah, you, when you think everybody wants to leave a legacy, uh, and and one one that shines brightly upon them, and for him, he left a legacy of being the president of the United States, and I mean you can't get much much bigger than that. But there are things in your past that you, you kind of wish didn't happen, that did. Yes, yes, and yes, maybe true, people, true. And maybe if people sort of. If you if you decided that you're happy with the the major thing you did in life, then you could look back at the small goofy things you didn't and laugh at them at the same time. Well, the the uh, Marta who works for me, and John Max, who's one of the top comedy writers in the world, took the material that I did just dictating, talking about all these stories, and I'd sit around and have a little tequila, a little vodka, whatever, and I would tell these stories. They yeah. all wound up in sections like in the book, and what I did was take out. Anything that Jolene didn't want to read about and mm -hmm. anything that I thought would get me in trouble. So the book is really a, a memoir of funny moments that I've had. And there's stuff that uh, could have been in the book that is not. And there's things that shouldn't have been in the book that are. But it's a collection of funny moments that I've shared. The thing that I love about when people read it, they say it makes them feel good. They pick it up and they read. And yeah. uh, that's what I think I need. I could write a different book, but it wouldn't be funny. Well, true. So many memoirs and, and uh, that people have written, they tend to be mean spirited. It's like they're, they're taking the opportunity for payback to, to get back at people for things that they did to them. Your book is written with the kindest regard for everyone involved. 
I've already paid back all the people I owe. Not really, <laughs> but most of them, I, I don't think I ever fully paid them back. But uh, uh, see, everybody in the book, now, so far I haven't had any objections from people in the book because it is true. And it's uh, my adventures with Cher, you know, they're true. And uh, uh, Cher had always worked with Sonny, and Sonny told her what to do, and she listened. Well, when Sonny was gone, she never wanted another man to tell her what to do. So my relationship with Cher was uh, not the easy. It was wonderful, and I love her. It's a very talented lady, but uh, it was something to convince her to do different things. So she called me Hammer, and uh, I guess you can visualize the relationship. Okay, Hammer, because that was my, <laughs> my way of convincing Cher to do things. But I had a great time with Cher. And uh, one of a very talented lady, and she's an event. Cher would have been an event as a manicurist. She's yeah. strange, weird, funny, and I love her. And I had a great time with her. Not easy. That's why she called me Hammer. There have been many, many books written about Frank Sinatra o- over the years, and and yeah. some of them um, n- not very kind to him whatsoever. Sure. But occasionally. Um, you you see passages in books written about Sinatra that show you a different side of him. And it's almost as though there were like two Frank Sinatras. One was the mean thug kind of guy. And another guy was extremely giving and very generous and helping people out without anybody knowing about it. Did you know how generous he was? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Nobody ever asked him for a donation. But the request got to Frank but didn't get a donation. Everything you've written about, heard or written or read, about Sinatra has a grain of truth in it because he was a very broad person. So all of the things that are reported that he did, he did a lot of that. But there, it was the secret to Sinatra. My secret to Sinatra was making him laugh. And if you could make him laugh, you could own him. But in the meantime, he anybody ever asked him for a donation, got a donation. Anybody asked him to perform, he would show up and bring a tuxedo and perform. He was, he was a truly unique individual. And uh, but all of the stories about Frank have a grain of truth in them. You know, we had great fun with him. He kept me up long. You talk about you delivered a eulogy at his, his funeral, and you describe it as quote the most difficult moment in my life. Yes, because Barbara Sinatra, when Frank died, we were all very, very, very sad because I was sitting up with him the night before he died, and it was like very sad to realize it was coming to an end. This colorful, vo- volatile, exciting, electric personality was starting to fade and so when he died and Barbara Sinatra said she wanted me to do one of the eulogies I said Barbara I tell jokes I, I don't I'm not good at I know I can't do that she said you have to do this for Frank so I said okay I'll do one of the eulogies but just so long as I don't have to follow Gregory Peck because I mean that would be awesome sure enough here we are now we're in the we're in the, the church the cathedral and uh, I'm following Gregory Peck and I'm being introduced by the bishop well, I stood up and the bishop said, here is George Schleyer, and I didn't know what to say. So I said, thank you, your honor. Well, the words your honor had never been used with the bishop. I've done to talk to a lot more judges than, than bishops. You know? <laughs> so the whole place cracked up at me calling the bishop your honor. And Frank, <laughs> Frank would have sat up. He called me crazy. Frank would have sat up in the box and said, come on, crazy. But uh, uh, the bishop never got over being called your honor. But that that, see, strangely enough, what happened is that turned a very sad, emotionally draining experience, Frank Sinatra's funeral, calling the bishop your honor and having Gregory Peck do jokes. That turned the whole thing into a celebration, and yeah. that made it worthwhile. But I'm, I don't do any more eulogies, because the bishop, unless I can go with the bishop. you know. <laughs> <laughs> the whole book, hopefully, captures... There's no transitions. There's no one thing doesn't go into the next thing. No, all just no. Like else, right? And that's the way my memory works. When it works at all, it works in little bits and pieces. And that's what I hope to do is capture moments in my life that I thought were funny and I wanted to share them with anybody who's got $2 to pick up the book, you know? Well, it's interesting because it, it, as I as I read the book, I, I realized that, you know, like at first I thought, well, I mean, this could be turned into a motion picture. And then I realized it, it couldn't be turned into a motion picture because it's not it, it's it's not it's not really sequential. It's a, it's a collection of great stories is what it is. That's it. That's it. It's like confetti, you know, and, and no, no, I've seen a lot of motion. Picture. I've done I've done a couple of movies and so forth. But this this is not that this is nothing. This is nothing other than 
just a series of episodes that are funny about funny people and funny episodes and funny accidents. And uh, that's really all my attention span can handle. When you think about it, it's in, in a sense, it's, it's kind of like an, an episode of Laugh-In. It's a series of jump cuts from one story to another story, none of which has anything to do with the other one in most cases. That, that was the secret of laughing. NBC came to me. They had nothing to put on Monday night at 8 o'clock. They said, we don't have anything. But, but can you do anything? I said, yes. So I sold them this thing. It was all young character people. They were not variety artists. They were not uh, actors. They were young characters, Goldie and Lily and Joanne and Artie. And uh, they said, well, what is it? And I said, well, it's just things I did with them. So we put it all together, and the network looked at this and said, this doesn't make any sense. I said, yeah. They said, the audience laughed, and they're smarter than you are. So anyhow, uh, they put it on the air reluctantly. Monday night at 8 o'clock, they were getting no rating at all, opposite Lucy and Gunsmoke. So, so we put it on the air, and the audience didn't know what to think because it was yeah. all these little tiny bits and pieces and rim shots. And at one time, one of the big fights was we said, don't go away. We'll be right back. We went to Black and came and said, see, we told you we'd be right back. The network said, you can't do that. You're not, you're not doing that. You, you, you're telling the audience to tune out. So I said, no, I'm telling the audience to tune back in. The fights we had with the network and the censors, they always picked at the wrong thing because we said, you know, we said things that they weren't used to hearing said. But the fact that it broke all of the rules was refreshing because we were so inundated with rules and, and things you can't say, can't say. And the network would always point to the wrong things. You can't say this and you can't say that. And uh, Lily Tomlin talking to William for Buckley. Well, she was, yeah. she was just <laughs> William for Buckley. And our devotion to the F word always made him very nervous. You know, look that up in your funk and leg. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. See, it made him nervous because nobody had ever done anything like that. Nothing about laughing was dirty. It was just so fast. That it was it felt body. Well, everything was everything was a was 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 a was a, a changeup pitch. Uh, you know, what, yep, you, yep. You, you're expecting a fastball, and here comes a changeup, and and Absolutely. and it just kind of snuck by everybody. And then sometimes you would laugh like about two minutes after the joke or the bit was over. You go, oh gosh, I just got it now. That was the secret, or the next day. And the interesting thing is, little kids saw the blackouts and the colors and the water and. The waterfalls and the splashes and the hammers with it. And little kids saw one show. Older people saw something else where they loved Goldie and the bikinis and Lily, whatever. And then in the middle were the aware, uh, intelligent young people who realized we were saying some very heavy political things, but saying so fast they didn't get on to it. I, I had a good time. Ted Wallison returns in a moment. Hey, it's Ted Wallace for Tom's Place. Our fall merchandise is starting to arrive, and we've got massive amounts of summer clothing that needs to be cleared. Blowout prices on virtually everything, like designer suits, regularly up to $5.99, now from $167 to $267. Beautiful sports jackets, starting at only $167, and designer dress pants and shirts, all at $67. Check out our deals throughout the store on the very best of designer menswear. Huge savings off our already below retail prices. If you need a suit for an upcoming wedding or any special occasion, we are Toronto's one-stop suit shop. For the finest outfit for every occasion, there is no better time to find the perfect addition to your wardrobe. Tom's Place is open daily, 11 to 6 weekdays, 10 to 5 Saturday, and 12 to 5 on Sunday. Visit Tom's Place, 190 Baldwin in Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 
309-0387. That's 1-866-309-0387. Or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca. That's info at etpcanada.ca. Now, folks, it's sock it to me time. <laughs> sock it to me, honey. Well, I've never been bald before. Hey, it must be sock it to me time. <laughs> sock it to me? Suck it to me, suck it to me, suck it to me, suck it to me. Suck it to yourself. Suck it to me? <laughs> now back to Ted Walsh. So much of, of what went on, so much of the dialogue that went on, so many of the expressions that went on became part of the part of the a popular culture. Uh, soccer to me, um, yeah. here come the judge, uh, say good night, Dick, good night, Dick. You know those things. It just kept repeating, that repeating. Up, I mean, in your, uh, your Funk and Wagdos, exactly right. I mean, I didn't know. I did. I I thought Funk and Wagdo was something that was just made up until somebody explained to me later on. No, no, no. It's actually the dictionary. It was the leading dictionary. dictionary, but nobody ever said, look that up in your funk and wagon. Right? The way we yeah. said it sounded like it was uh, wrong, you know? <laughs> you talk about Goldie Hawn, right? And, I mean, she played this ditzy, uh, giggly, dumb blonde. And, that, and you, you, Actually you, not. You say See, that not, she's the not. Goldie Hawn. Goldie Hawn came, and, and we talked to her one day. She said, what do you want me on the show for? I'm a dancer. I'm not a comic. I said, no. So I said, just come on in. We gave her an introduction of Dan Rowan. And she read this introduction and screwed it up so bad. And I said, what? And so they said, Doc, we'll do it again. I said, no, no, hold on, hold on. She says, I'll do it again. I said, no, Goldie, that'll be just fine. From that yeah. moment on, we never let Goldie rehearse. So we would do terrible things to divert her attention where she never could get anything right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, for sure. And, and, and she's had an incredible career since then. And you think of some of the other characters, like Ruth Buzzy's character is, is the, the old lady. Um, Ruth Buzzy sent me, Ruth Buzzy sent me a, a picture of her in a trash barrel as Gladys, you know, the front figure. Yeah. She was a discarded human being. And I looked at this picture, and I just loved her. And I brought her in, and she sat down in, a, in our Xerox room at a little the electric piano, and sang her own composition of Don't Futz Around. And it was wonderful. <laughs> and I said, I wanted to do it. And Ruthie did many, many characters. And she was such a delightful personality with all of us. And characters just came out of Ruth Buzzy. And it was a major discovery. And then Lily Tomlin. Come on. You know, every, in every life, one Lily Tomlin should appear. But it wasn't Lily Tomlin appearing. Five, six different people would show up. And uh, we would take them, and she would do these voices. And then we put it on the air. And, and when she did Ernestine, the telephone operator, I mean, the yeah. world exploded. I mean, because uh, uh, she would attack people on the phone, you know. <laughs> you know and she'd call up, and she always <laughs> dialed. The one thing I contributed to Lily Tomlin was telling her to dial. When she was the operator, I said, dial with the middle finger. She said, what? I said, just dial. Don't wave, don't wave it, but just dial. What people, what people never realize is that when she was calling all of these political little people, individuals, celebrities, she was always dialing with the middle finger, one ringy-dingy, two ringy-dingies, <laughs> and uh, people were afraid of getting a call from her. This is Ernestine Tomlin. <laughs> is this the party to whom I am speaking? But when she called up William F. Buckley, it blew. He, was, he, was, he, was, he was fascinated. He was, they were afraid to take a call from Lily Tomlin, Ernestine, yeah. but then they were afraid not to because the people who wouldn't take her call were even funnier than the ones who would. Talk to me about the, the, the comic brilliance of, uh, of Jonathan Witters. I did Jonathan's first show, uh, yeah. one of his first. And, uh, uh, and it was, strangely enough, one of the first shows Jonathan did was with Art Carney, and I booked the two of them to do a stay. It was long before Laugh-In. And uh, um, it was, the year, it was, the, it was uh, the year of the Kennedy assassination. And we had this whole show planned, and uh, we read the show on a Friday, and... Uh, and then the assassination happened. The whole world was sad. 
So we came in the following Saturday to do the show. Everybody was very, very sad. So we, there was no show. We hadn't rehearsed anything. So I said, go down and get every prop in the, in the building and put them all up here on stage and let Jonathan Winters and Art Carney just play. And they said, well, what kind of show is that? I said, I know it's a show that's going to get me paid because it's going to air day after tomorrow. So they went down and we took Jonathan Winters and Art Carney. And all they did for an hour was just play with props. And we took that up and we said, NBC said, we hear you guys had a good time. We had a great time. They said, what's the show? And I said, here's the tape. So they looked at this tape, which is all just blackouts, all prop jokes, you know. And they said, that's fine, but it's not a show. I said, that's a show. I said, that's the newest thing on the continent. They call it Comedy Verte. I, I made it up, Comedy Verte, right? <laughs> and they said, Comedy Verte. And he said, Erwin, did you ever hear of Comedy Verte? Erwin, who was a real fraud, said, yeah, it's big on the continent, right? So they said, okay, so we put the show on, and it was Jonathan Winters, and it was Comedy Verte. And uh, that became some of the philosophy behind laughing because things were so fast that you laughed at this and when you said should I laugh at that or not they were laughing at something else the speed yeah. of it because we now we now uh, things move faster cars move faster everything moves fast except my dialogue doesn't move fast enough but there's mm-hmm. things happening so fast we can perceive information much much faster how did you manage to convince Richard Nixon to appear in laughing well Richard Nixon's closest friend is a man by the name of Paul Keyes and we had done the first show of laugh in the first year, and it was starting to happen. Everybody was talking about it. I said, I have to do something for the first show next year that would be volatile. And Paul Key says, maybe I can get Nixon. I said, great, get him for me, too. I was not a big Nixon fan. But we went down mm-hmm. the hall, and we got Richard Nixon. He said, what do you want me to say? Just say, sock it to me. Sock it to me? Yes, sir. So we took five takes of him trying to say, sock it to me. We took it, and we ran down the hall, put it in the next show, and it went on the air. And the next day, the world was saying... They had the next president of the United States saying, sock it to me. And mm-hmm. uh, that captured the audience and it made them aware that there was th- something happening then. From there, we went to Hubert Humphrey. We went to all of the Walter Cronkite. We went to all of the people who you did not expect to say anything funny, but they all yep. wanted to be in that window of young and, and acceptable. And it opened up the door to get all kinds, except John Wayne. Went to get John Wayne and it got him in the hall. And he said, I'm not going to do that show. People are crazy. I'm not doing that show. We put that on the air. And the, the, uh, and the, the, the obsession with taking defeat, taking negative reaction, and, and presenting it. You know, uh, uh, We even read bad reviews on the air and put rim shots in them like it was a comedy monologue. Yeah, and, yeah. and I miss anybody having the fun that we had. Part of the popularity of the book is there's very little you can pick up and read and makes you laugh. All I put in the book were funny episodes. There were other That's episodes right. of my life that were not that funny, uh, but I survived them and decided to do a book still laughing. And that's what you see. Well, it's, it's you know, a lot of people like to read before they go to bed. And, and oftentimes I find that a little disconcerting because depending on what you're reading, it can put you in, in, a, in a foul mood or a, a frightened mood if you're reading a, like a thriller or a horror book. But in your case, reading still laughing, a life in comedy, um, I mean, if you fall asleep with a smile on your face. And that's, that's yeah, a good way yeah, to yeah. end the day. Well, it is. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with going to bed with a laugh in spite of my early uh, sex life. Uh, but. <laughs> yeah, during the late 60s and 70s and 68 to 73 is when laughing ran. Mainstream television was the only television that was available. Today, you've got um, streaming channels and, and, and cable first came to be. Yes. Uh, censorship, yes. censorship disappeared. Uh, so therefore, if you wanted to do laughing today, you could do laughing on on a Netflix or a Hulu or, or wherever, where there are no censors, where where nothing is held back and nothing is 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 cut out, and there are no limits. Would that have made it better or worse? Well, I think it's unfortunate not to have some rules because most of the fun in life comes from breaking rules. So you'd have to find a new way. Uh, the speed would still work. The uh, but there are new people to attack. I mean, if I was on the air today, ooh, you know what I'd have for fun? I'd have with the, you know, Donald Trump. Boy, Jesus, you know. But and all of the politicians today. So, but you have to see the thing about satire is you have to be talking to an audience that's aware of what you're talking about. So the thing with doing comedy today, you have to explain what it's about first. But uh, it would be, it would be an adventure. I don't know what I would do if I had a show on the air today. 
Was, was there anybody who you really desperately wanted to get on laughing, but you just couldn't break through to get him? Mm. Almost everybody who we went after to get, we got. I mean, uh, uh, everybody from Lena Horn to Dinah Shore to uh, Richard Nixon to Walter Cronkite. I want to talk to you about about reality television. You're in in many ways you're considered to be the father of of reality television when you introduced Byron Allen, who I guess was like 18 years of age when, when 17 years old at the time on the Tonight Show. Wow, that's 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 incredible. But he was, he do... was we didn't have anybody black, we didn't have anybody young, and he was on the Tonight Show, and I thought he's a very bright young man, and we put him on Real People. He's quite he's quite the businessman. He he owns a, a chain of television radio stations, I believe. He's he's a he's a media yeah. mogul. Yeah, yeah, he he's a media mogul, right? And I, I wonder what did I do here? But I'm glad I'm glad to see I'm glad to see a breakout. A kid, seventeen years old, who I see on the Tonight Show, and he has now exploded this into a career as a businessman, and it proves that it can be done. When you look at what at, at what's what's coming onto the screen now in terms of reality television, is there something you like and something you don't like? What do you like on, in terms of reality? Because a lot of reality television is not reality television at all. No, no, no. Uh, uh, uh. Um, see, uh, accident. We've removed accident from television because it's pre the editing and so forth. I. I yeah, see, if I was doing a reality show today, I would round up every kind of cuckoo I could find because the eccentrics in our society are a valuable, valuable resource. And uh, if I was doing a reality show today, we did it on real people. We rounded up all kinds of weird people that became interesting. We found out that they were more interesting than we were. Do you think the corporations have, have stood in the way of creativity? And, and by that, I mean that there's... These bean counters seem to be have too much influence over what happens on on not only just in television but in media in general. Yes, they control it. They control the accountants of the enemy. You know, uh, yeah. they decide what is profitable before they decide what is good, and uh, uh, good should precede profitable. Uh, but again, you see, like they say, you know, time. Time wounds all heals, right? Um, the, the necessity, the fact that the television audience is starting to shrink, and they've they've abused the little the creative people who they must need, and uh, the the uh, talented people that don't have a window. And um, uh, when that opens up, the audience is going to be there and say, "Hey, we want this." It will happen. It it'll rat. It's a tough time we're going to go through because all the time the writers and everybody are on strike. Nothing really is getting developed, and it should be. So uh, maybe when the interview is over, I'll sit down and try to think of something unusual. But see, my my head is always full of different things that it shouldn't be. Uh, but I may, uh, I'm tempted to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to give them one more shot and do something that's truly inventive and unusual and provocative and uh, um, dangerous. Well, do you do you long for that? Like, do you? I mean, if you wanted to go to a, to a network and say, "Listen," I mean, I'm sure you could. You'd, you'd find you'd find the support, you'd find the talent, you'd find everything that you would need to put something on television, whether it be a special or whether it be a series or a series of specials, for that matter. Is it? Do you have that? Does do you crave that today? Well, it's an obsession, you know. It's a, uh, what you're talking about is a kind of a, a psychological problem. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an answer in search of a solution. You know, I mean, uh, I'm an answer in search of a problem. Um, mm -hmm. It's there. See, television now. We are committed. We now are locked onto television. We must watch television. We can't help it. And uh, what we put on that box. Um, but see, everything now conforms to a set amount of time, the commercials, the, the blackout, the time, next station, station break, everything is so predictable. And, uh, uh, if I were doing a television show today, it would not be 30 minutes or an hour. It would be 17 minutes and it would not be, uh, uh, in color of black and white. It would be 
color and black and white all at the same time. Something to attack your attention. And uh, it's very everything conforms now. The same amount of time, same amount of commercials, the same amount of air, and the same colors and the same everything. Everything is so the, the, the bookkeepers have taken over. As a kid, when I was in school, I was a class clown, and 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 I paid sure. for it, uh, you know. And you're and not I over that it, yet. I think, by the way. I, exactly, and I hope I hope I never do. And and I think that the only teachers that I really disliked were the ones who let me get away with it, because when they let you get away with it, there's there's no barrier. You're not breaking any rules, and if you're not breaking any rules, there's nothing to laugh at, as you pointed out. That's it. That's it. Uh, uh, I was always in. I was always in. In trouble. I was always. I spent more time in the principal's office than the principal did. You know. <laughs> you got to find some joy in the problem. You know, the problem problems are there because they are provocative. Answers are elusive because uh, they're fun. But the main thing is the main thing is that I've enjoyed a long and and suspicious career, and the book I think captures some of the some of the energy. Some of the outrage, some of the uh, impatience, some of the uh, uh, disdain for the uh, controversy for you know convention, um, and when you introduce, when you put all of that into a bucket, and you say to somebody, "You want to come over to the house and see something?" They would come over much faster than you say, "You want to see a, a painting?" You know. Uh, so we've got. I think what you've got to do, if you if you can contribute, make a major contri- contribution. Say to all your viewers now, not young, any age, and say, "What would you? What do you miss on television? What would you like to see that's not there now?" And you might get some interesting answers because it, it would be possible to do a lot of things that are not on now. Um, yeah. um, unfortunately, I can't think of them now because I'm, you know, ninety-year-old joke junkie. Yeah, <laughs> I I I wish you would do that, George. I really do. I, I wish I wish you would just take the bull by the horns and say, you know, what, what the hell? Let's just do this. Yeah. Well, they will. They will. Uh, uh, the only problem is now it's spread out so much, and the executives are making so much money, and the the underlings are making so little money. It's going to be a tough sell because nobody wants to nobody wants to dis- disturb the status quo. You cannot say to an executive making $10 million a month or a year, uh, here's what you ought to do. Because you know, they're, they're right now, they're, they're making a lot of money. I mean, some of those yeah. salaries are obscene. Um, but I believe that, I don't know, I wish I, were, I wish I were about 50 years younger because I, I'd really sneak in the back door and give them another shot right behind the ear. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the audience needs it. Yeah, well, you can read a lot about uh, about the life that, that you uh, that you lived, and some very very funny stories, and some fascinating. I mean, it's it's a in many ways it's a great history of of Hollywood. It's called Still Laughing: A Life in Comedy. Uh, it's I highly recommend it, and if you can, it's the you. kind of book that you can read, put aside, and when you're having a lousy day and it's pouring rain outside, pick it up and start reading again and watch the temperature of the you. house change. That's the- that's the purpose of the book. That's what we were aiming for. And you've captured the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That'll do for another episode. And thank you very much for joining us as we come oh so close to uh, our celebrating our second anniversary. That's coming up in, I think, two weeks from now. Uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. We hope that you've enjoyed it. And if you're just new to the audience, uh, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to check out the website, www.tedwallishan.com. Dot ca. You'll find all our past episodes available for you there and a place for you to leave your comments and your thoughts and questions. And we'd appreciate that. And while you're online, don't forget to fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallachian Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing estate administration with ease. The Ted Wallace and Podcast is produced by me, Becky Coles. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. For more information on this podcast and our sponsors, and to talk to Ted, go to www.tedwallishan.ca.